to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the scriptures are abundantly clear on god's teaching concerning baptism over and over again we are taught throughout scripture that to be saved a person must first be baptized. There is no salvation without baptism in God's plan of salvation. A multitude of passages teach this. For example, in Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Notice, belief and baptism are both done prior to salvation. Jesus taught in John 3 and verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of heaven. You can't get to heaven, Jesus said, without being baptized. Peter made it so clear in 1 Peter 3.21 when he said, Baptism does now also save us. Look, baptism saves, the scripture says. And think about the accounts of conversion in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was, repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. Think about Paul's own count of conversion. He was told, you go in the city and it'll be told you what you must do. Well, what was essential for Paul to do? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. When pressed with the biblical evidence on baptism, many people because of a preconceived idea or because of the simple fact that they think they're saved and baptism, what the scriptures teach on baptism conflicts with that, will throw out arguments. One of the most popular arguments against baptism for the remission of sins is the old thief on the cross. Now here's how the argument goes. The thief was saved. Luke chapter 23 verse 42, Jesus said to the thief, this day you'll be with me in paradise. The thief was never baptized, therefore this person may be saved without being baptized. Is the thief a good example of salvation in the New Testament without baptism? Is this an example for us to follow today? This example is not proof at all. It is an assumption based on an example of Old Testament salvation while Jesus was alive and had the power to forgive sins any way he wanted. Now you can find out the accounts of the thief in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 38, Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 27, and Luke chapter 23, beginning around verse 39. And here's what we know about this argument and why it won't hold water. The whole argument is based on a false assumption. The thief was never baptized. Where does the scripture say that? Where's the passage that says, oh yeah, that thief who said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, and the one Jesus said today, you'll be with me in paradise. Where's the scripture that says he was never baptized? Well, there isn't one. Then it's not a logical argument that you can base your salvation on. It is a mere assumption to say the thief was never baptized is to say a whole lot more than the Bible says. Now, are we going to come out and affirm that he was? The Bible doesn't say either way. But you can't base your salvation on an assumption. That's not the way Christians work. Christians never assume anything. The Bible says that our mindset should be, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 teaches us, that it should be to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Where's the proof? that the thief was never baptized? Well, there is none. In fact, we could come a lot closer to proving the thief was a religious man who evidence may suggest he was baptized more than you could come proving he wasn't baptized. Now, let me illustrate. The thief, his knowledge 
suggest that he was a very religious man. He wasn't your average common criminal. The knowledge and the information we're given in Scripture suggests that he knew more about Christ and his kingdom than some of Jesus' own disciples did. Luke chapter 23 and verse 40 teaches us this was a man who realized the existence of God. We're not talking about an atheist or an agnostic. This is a man who believes in God. For he said to the other thief who had reviled Jesus, Do you not even fear God, seeing we are under the same condemnation? This is a man who recognized the existence of God, who recognized His sovereignty, His power, and His handiwork even up to the point of His death. This was a man who had a standard, whether he followed it or not, may be debatable, but this is a man who had a good standard of right and wrong. For example, in Luke 23, 41, the thief said again to the other thief, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deed. What's he saying? We're getting what we deserve. We broke the law. We violated the standard of right and wrong, and what we're going to get is what we deserve. And so he believed in God. He, he recognized the standard of right and wrong, and he believed believe Christ was a king. Luke chapter 23 verse 42, he said to Jesus who is also on the cross, Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom. Can you have a kingdom without a king? Absolutely not. This man realized Jesus was a king. Revelation 19, 16, he is king of kings and lord of lords. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 12 following, he is the great potentate or supreme ruler. And so he realized some things about Christ. This man also believed some things about the kingdom and the other side knew some things about it that Jesus' disciples didn't even get. He believed death would not stop Christ's kingdom. Now, what was the disciples' view of Christ's kingdom? Acts chapter 1, after the death of Jesus, they said, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They had a worldly, physical mindset. And yet this man said in Luke 23, 42, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. This man and Jesus both know people don't come down from crosses. People don't come down from crosses alive. And yet he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. What's that imply? This man believed death would not stop the kingdom of Christ. He believed there'd be remembrance on the other side. Lord, remember me. He knew that the grave was not the end. The Sadducees didn't even get that. He knew the grave was not the end. He knew that there would be remembrance on the other side in eternity, and there was more to life than what was seen on the physical side. This man knew of the perfection of Christ. Luke chapter 23, verse 41, he said, This man has done nothing wrong. We're getting what we deserve, he said, but this man has done nothing wrong. He knew Christ was a perfect man. He was tempted in all points, yet he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Again, something that a lot of people in his day didn't understand. And this man knew about the resurrection of Christ. Remember Luke 23, 42? Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. If people don't come down from crosses, and they didn't, and this man wanted Jesus to remember him in his kingdom, he knew something about the resurrection and the kingdom of Christ that existed beyond this world, that existed and would come into existence in Acts chapter 2. And so when we look at this man's background, this man looks like one who had been a follower of John, maybe, or a follower of Christ at one point even. We're not sure on that, but the evidence suggests he was a man who knew a lot of things that even the disciples didn't get. Now, what does all that mean? This helps us to understand this is not your average criminal. This is not your average thief. This is a man who had some religious background, and we could say, while the evidence doesn't go either way and we don't have proof, we could say there'd probably be more evidence if we were going to make a case to prove he was baptized, then they wasn't. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, and in John 4, verses 1 through 3, the Bible records that all Jerusalem, Judea, and all the regions round about went out to John to be baptized by him. Now, how does that prove anything? We're not saying, affirming here, that that man was in there, but he may have been. 
He very well could have been. He already had a religious background more than the disciples at time. If all Jerusalem and all the regions thereabout went out to be baptized by John and this man had a religious background, how do you know he wasn't one of those people? Well, here's the point. You can't know either way. If I were going to say one way or the other, we'd have to say the evidence seems to suggest that he was a religious man who could have been in that crowd. But the point is, we don't know either way. Are you going to base your salvation off of an assumption? The thief was never baptized cannot be proven. It is only an assumption, and yet it is center and pivotal to the whole argument. And you can't even prove that. That's not an argument at all. That's an assumption, a supposition. And if we base our salvation on that, there's going to be a rude day of awakening on the judgment. And so what's the point? The point remains. He may or may not have been baptized. We simply don't know. And I'm not going to base my salvation off a of best guess of anybody or what somebody thinks may have happened. Secondly, the thief is not a good example of salvation today because the thief lived and died under the old covenant. Are these people examples of salvation for us? Would you say that Noah is an example of salvation for men and women today? No, we're not going to go out and build an ark or offer sacrifices or any of those things. What about Moses? Not an example of salvation for us. Abraham is not. David is not. King Hezekiah is not. Solomon is not. Why not? Why, why are those men not good examples of salvation? Because they lived and died under the old covenant and they're not examples for us today. The fact is, the thief would fit right in the category with Noah and Moses and Abraham because he lived and died under the Old Testament. Now I want you to notice this chart. This chart helps us to see exactly at what point in God's law, God's laws to mankind, did the thief die. This line represents God's laws throughout history. We begin with this chart with the Mosaic Law. Beginning in Exodus chapter 20, God began giving the Law of Moses. And you'll notice right in the middle of that line, we have the cross. The cross is the point in time in which God stopped reigning under the Law of Moses, stopped giving the Law of Moses and making men and women amenable to that. And the new law, on the other side of the cross forward to today, we're under the new law. Hebrews 9 verses 15 through 17 says, A law is in effect after men are dead. And so if Jesus' death on the cross is that time and point when the new law began to transition in, Acts chapter 2 when it was first preached, from the cross forward would be New Testament salvation, New Testament examples, and from that cross backward would be Old Testament. Now let's place the thief in this line. Would he fall on the New Testament side or the Old Testament side. The thief and Jesus both would be on the Old Testament side. Jesus lived and died under the old law. His death is what brought about the new law and thus if the thief is under the old covenant, under the old law, I'm not going to look to him for salvation any more than I would look to Abraham or Moses or Noah. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 makes it clear that the, the old law was nailed to the cross. Notice these words. The scripture says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, notice, having nailed it to the cross. When Jesus died, he nailed the old law to the cross, and from that time forward, we're living under the new covenant. Well, again, the thief is right there on the Old Testament side of God's covenant. And so we can't use him as an example of New Testament salvation. But I want you to think about this also. While Jesus was on earth, he had the power to forgive sins in any which way he chose. While alive, while living here on the earth, he could forgive sins in any way he wanted. Uh, notice the words of Mark chapter 10 and verse 2. What does the scripture teach about Jesus' power to forgive sin? The Bible says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, Jesus said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Jesus here had power 
to forgive sins while on earth any way you wanted to. When Jesus died, then his testament went into place. Jesus is no longer here on the earth in physical form. He died and his testament went into place. And thus we're going to be judged by the testament, the new covenant of Christ today. We're not living under the law of Moses. John 1 verse 17, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth are in Jesus. We're going to be judged by the words of Jesus Christ today. Notice the teaching of John chapter 12 and verse 48. The scripture says, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And so what do we learn about the thief on the cross? It is based clearly on assumption. You cannot prove one way or the other whether the thief was baptized. He may have been, he may not have been, but we don't build arguments that our people's souls are based on on assumptions. You can't prove it either way. Secondly, he's not an example of New Testament salvation. Just like others under the old law, he was under the old covenant. Now, we want to look to New Testament salvation we look to God's teaching in the book of Acts. Matthew through John tell us about the, the life of Christ, what He did, how He lived His life, the things that He did for us in His teaching, and then when Jesus dies at the end of those accounts, then men and women are taught what they must do to become a Christian. The book of Acts answers the great question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. And so if I want to find out examples of salvation today, I'm going to turn to the book of Acts and find out what those people did. And thirdly, the thief is not a good example of salvation because while Jesus was alive, the scripture says he had power on earth to forgive sins. When Jesus died, His covenant went into effect, and we're going to be judged by the words of Christ today. That's our standard, and that's our God, and how we need to be sure not to depart from the right hand or to the left. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7. How we need to be sure that we don't add to or take away from the teaching of the New Testament. And so for just a few minutes, let's consider, now that we've dealt with that argument, which won't hold water. Let's deal with what the scriptures do say concerning baptism. Let's refresh our mind about some of the passages that teach with clarity what a person must do to be saved. I want you to notice first and foremost Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. What Jesus teach here? The Bible says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus clearly taught in this passage there are two requirements that a person must meet to be saved. He who believes. Does everybody agree that you've got to believe to be saved? Most religious people who believe in Christ will say, sure, if you don't believe, you're going to be lost. Baptism is conjoined with belief in such a way that the two are inseparable. If you don't meet both of those, you can't be saved. It's like saying this, he who eats and drinks will be filled. You've got to meet both requirements. If I just eat, I'm not going to be filled. If I just drink, I'm not going to be filled. Until I do both, then am I filled. The same is true concerning baptism. Well, someone says, ah, oh, Jesus didn't say toward the end of it, he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. Jesus only said, he who does not believe will be condemned. Let me ask you this. If you don't believe, are you even a candidate to be baptized? Of course not. It would be redundant, if not ridiculous, for Jesus to say, he who does not believe, and oh yeah, even though you don't believe, if you're not baptized, you'll be condemned also. If you don't believe, you're surely not going to be baptized. That is a logical uh, following from not believing. And so Mark 16, 16 makes it clear. Belief and baptism are both essential to salvation. Let's look at another passage. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Notice what the scripture says here. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter is here preaching on Pentecost when the law goes forth from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2, verses 3 and 4. He proclaims Jesus as the way of salvation. He preaches to the Jews, you killed your own Messiah. They cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? How can we overcome the sin of killing our Messiah? And Peter did not say, don't do anything, Jesus has done it for you. Peter did not say, say the sinner's prayer. Peter did not say, believe only and you'll be saved. Peter said, you need to repent and you need to be baptized. And what was the reason? For the remission of sins. Now, why is that important? Remember, it is sin that separates a man from God. In Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 the scripture says, The Lord's ear is not heavy that he cannot hear, his arms not shortened that he cannot save, but your sins and your iniquities have separated your God from you, or your, your sins have separated you from your God. Sin severs the relationship with God and man. If I can know the exact point in time when sins are removed, I can know when God and man are joined and when salvation occurs. When are sins remitted? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now someone says, well, I know the Bible says that, but that word for there means because of. It doesn't mean that, and here's how you can know proof positive. Matthew 26, verse 28, Jesus this is the same syntax, same Greek syntax as in Acts 2.38. Jesus said, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many, listen, for the remission of sins. Is Jesus there saying His blood was shed because of? If you're going to take one, you've got to take the other. Same Greek syntax. We know that Jesus is saying, My blood was shed so that you could receive the forgiveness of sins. And we know baptism is for looking toward the purpose in order to receive the forgiveness of one's sins. Well, let's think about another example. Notice what the scripture teaches in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. The Bible says, Ananias is speaking to Saul and he says, And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here's Saul's account. What did Saul have to do to get right with God? Remember, he was wreaking havoc on the church. Jesus confronts him on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? You go in the city. It'll be told you what you must do. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Acts 22, 16 tells us what that must was. Now remember, if sin separates me from God, the moment sins are washed away is the moment I'm saved. Acts 22, 16 again says, Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If baptism is the point in time when my sins are washed away, I can't be saved a moment before that. Someone says, well, all you've got to do is call on the name of the Lord. That's what Acts 2.21 says. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Indeed it does. But let's let the Bible be its own best commentary. Did you notice the last part of Acts 22.16? Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How do you call on the name of the Lord, biblically speaking, you get up and you do what God says concerning baptism. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord correctly. And then someone says, well, okay, that's all good and well, but are you saying baptism saves? We're saying the Bible says that. Notice the words of 1 Peter 3, 21. I want you to notice this little phrase here. Peter says, baptism does now also save us. Not alone, combined with hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, but notice what the scripture does say in 1 Peter 3.21. Baptism does now save us. How clearer could God be than that? Are you saying that a person has to be baptized to go to heaven? We're saying that's what Jesus said. John 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, unless Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't get in God's kingdom, which ultimately he's coming back for and who will reside in heaven, unless you obey God's plan of salvation concerning water baptism. Salvation is in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. 
all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. If salvation's in Christ, if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, the next question is, how do I get in Christ? Galatians 3.27 tells us, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Look at that clear teaching. If salvation and all spiritual blessings are in Christ, and if I get into Christ being by being baptized, I can't be saved until I've done what God says concerning baptism. All throughout the book of Acts, in every account, in the account of Simon the sorcerer, in the account of the Ethiopian eunuch, in the account of Lydia, in the account of the Corinthians, in every account, Baptism is the integral point at which one stops becoming a sinner and starts becoming a child of God. Friend, we ask you today, have you submitted to God's teaching concerning baptism? The scriptures are undeniable. The major argument is not an argument at all. It's only assumption. Don't base your salvation on what some people think the thief did. Base your salvation upon the Word of God. Have you heard that Word? Are you willing to submit to it? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Are you willing to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch asked, Here's water, what doth hinder me? And the response was, If you believe with all your heart, you may. Have you believed in Jesus as the Son of God? Are you willing to repent and turn from sin that your sins may be blotted out? Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Will you make that good confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Acts 8 verse 36 and 37. And won't you be baptized in water? for the forgiveness of your sins. Don't buy into the idea that baptism is just an outward sign of an inward grace. The Bible teaches baptism is something you do prior to salvation. It's the point at which you contact the blood of Jesus, Romans 6, 1 through 4, and if you haven't done that, listen carefully, if you haven't done that, we say to you kindly and lovingly, you are not saved. You are still in your sin and you will perish eternally if you don't make that right. We're begging you, we're pleading with you today. Won't you be baptized for the remission of your sins? We hope you will. God wants you to. The decision is yours. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.